This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Paul Downs Kalezo. Oh, yeah, all right. Close enough? Yeah. So try and like spice it up. Uh, writer, director, probably many other things for Brittany Runs a Marathon. Um, I want to start about the inspiration of this because it's a great story. Um, I know that this is based on a friend of yours. Obviously, her story was changed somewhat from what occurred in the film. Um, what was that process like in terms of taking inspiration and creating something original and at the same time, honoring your friend and at the same time, not sort of like co-opting her story yeah. and something that she can still enjoy herself. Or well, something. the first step was to make it not her. So she's Brittany O'Neill. This is Brittany Forgler. The first step was giving myself the freedom to tell a story that was independent of what I was inspired by. What I was inspired by was this girl who was my friend who I love and I've loved and is... Uh, as she took control of her life and figured out how she wanted to make incremental changes that could amount to a big change. Uh, that was awesome, watching her make that decision and follow through on that decision. After that, you know, I was living with her at the time, so there was nuance and pathos that was just from uh, that I could take inspiration from just by being near her while she was going through this. Sure. Yeah. It was a funny, fun process, a sad process, a traumatic process, an inspirational process, a surprising process. All of that I got to experience and I'm sure that has worked its way into the film in intentional ways and ways I don't even know. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, what, had, what ended up happening was I outlined the film before a lot of it happened in real life. And then mm -hmm. as she was living her life, things that had already outlined happened. Um, Interesting. So yeah. A little psychic in the process. Yeah. Like, it was, really? The only time she was ever mad at me in this film was when a, a plot point in the film came true in real life. And she was <laughs> like, why did you write that? Um, but... Uh, you know, she's a, she's, uh, she, we went to school together, uh, at NYU. And so she understands art and, and how inspiration works. And she was never, um, she was never tough or offended and always supportive and always ha happy to weigh in if I needed, uh, oh. Uh, At what point do you actually like propose this to her though? Because it's like I, I, I didn't mean, I, propose I, it. I can't I just imagine. Sort of told her. I can't imagine just like sitting around with some friends and one of them just being like, "Oh, by the way, I want to make a film." It's about funny. You. So she went for her first run, and that day I was like, "That's a movie." And then months later, I, I couldn't tell you how many. She remembers this conversation. I don't. We were just sitting on the couch, and apparently I said to her, "I don't know if I should tell you this, but I'm writing a movie about you." And she said, what's it called? And I said, Brittany runs a marathon. And she goes, when does she, how, how fast is her time? And I was like, well. <laughs> Brittany runs a four hour marathon yeah, exactly. is going to be the new title. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I'd never asked. It was just sort of what it was. But I also didn't, I knew that she would be fine with whatever. And honestly, if, if she wasn't, I would change the name. I mean, it's so, it's so not her story in so many ways. None of the other characters are real. Um, they're all drawn from uh, the, my life or the, the arc I wanted her to go on and, and who needed to be on that story with her. So not only did you write this, but this is your directorial debut. Yeah. So what was the sort of process like in terms of that? Like I realize, you know, or I mean, at least conceptually, I can realize the idea of like, you know, script sort of is like your child. You want to sort of see it play out yeah. before your eyes. But at the same time, like, to also be taking the responsibility of like, not only did I write this, but I have to represent you as the director now too. Was that sort of process like as an artist, but also as somebody who's like shepherding this project that's inspired by someone you actually know? Here's the thing is, you know, I know at that point, I, at that point, by the time that we got to production, this character was living on its own on the page. And Jillian Bell, who's amazing in the film, joined phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal, yeah, joined seven months before. And there was, you know, when you're a writer, I've always said it's like you're an alien. You give birth to an alien baby, and then you have to hand the alien baby off to humans to be like, this is how aliens are cared for, and you just hope for the best. And so. I, you know, as a director of this film, I, it still felt like I had to sort of change gears and, and um, break some bad news to the writer self of myself, part of myself about 
how this was going to go down. Uh, but but Jillian being on board, it, there was a slow pass off of the character from what I envisioned and what I imagined into her hands and her heart and her body and her soul to the point that we got on the same page well before we started filming. So when we were on set, we both knew what this character was, what the beats were, what the, you know. And the other thing I learned is that everything is writing. The craft of writing is, is as far as what is important, is the same as acting, it's the same as editing, it's the same as directing. You're creating mini stories that all add up to a story. And so looking at each beat as its own beat, understanding what you need from that for your emotional arc, just creating a spine of a story and then you can take inspiration and moments and play off of that with your actors and, and your production heads and, and your cinematographer. You, you know, you're, you, as long as you're within the bounds of each beat as it relates to the whole, you really get to have fun outside of that. So I didn't know what a director was technically just because I'd never done it. I hadn't trained in it. I, I'd been on sets and I'd been in rehearsal sure. for plays, but for me, it, it just all became writing again. Even the camera work became, I needed to translate it in a way that I understood and I understood character, so I just looked at the camera as a character. There was a narrator, this narrator is the character. What are the characteristics mm -hmm. of that narrator? And how is he or she or this ca character telling the story? Your theater background was kind of interesting to me, and I was kind of curious about how that impacted your um, approach to directing. And it's sort of interesting because of what you're talking about, and I'm thinking about it in terms of the context of like what you write on a page versus what works, you know, actually yeah. in, on stage or something like that. And I'm wondering if your experience doing that and seeing how things translate in front of people to the stage impacted how you approached it because sometimes you have a great idea and it might just not work when you're trying to translate it from the page. How did how did your sort of theatrical experience impact that process? Was it a help? Was it a hindrance? Was it's interesting. It... It's a bunch of different things. I mean, in some ways you learn that what needs to be said in theater can be shown in film. Mm -hmm. And so you write these very long scenes and you realize you only need three of those lines because you can you can show, show the thing, yeah. you know. You don't need to say anything yeah. that you can see. In fact, actually, in film, a lot of pe times people complain about too much exposition. So it's it's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, and sometimes, like, within a look, it's like, oh, I got it. You know, someone walks on, and you don't need to be like, I was down at the thing. Like, you get it. You feel like they were down at the thing. So you, you can show in a lot yeah. of ways that you can't tell in theater, show in theater. Um, but also, I mean, the biggest lesson I learned, I'm a big rehearsal guy. I love table work. I love sitting down with the script. I love going through it, getting on a philosophical, spiritual, same page as the cast. That does not happen in indie films. You do not have time for that. You are trying yeah. to, to, to shoot what you can shoot. Imagine like 20 days or something. We had 28 days, yeah. And like a lot of our time was spent in a makeup trailer because it's a, it, you know, we had a lot of, of, uh, of, making of, a, I don't want to give anything away, but there's, sure, you know, yeah, there's yeah. a transformation yeah, yeah. that happens that's part of the story. And so what I learned by the end is in theater, you rehearse. And really, when you're rehearsing, you're teaching those actors to become the editors of the story because no one's going to edit it. They're going to be up there and they're going to curate the moments. And they have to live them out in a real way on stage. In film, you make the movie and then you go into an edit bay by yourself with your editor, and that's where your rehearsal process is. You are alone with your options. What if the look was here? What if that happened more quietly? What if there was yeah. tension here? What if this was actually kind of funny? What if, you know? And so you're, you're on set, you're really creating what you'll have in your rehearsal room, and then you go in and you rehearse alone and craft a story based on the colors that you've had. The colors you've made. Yeah, I kind of think of it as sort of like three phases of actual storytelling. There's the writer who actually creates the original script. Yeah. There's the director who, you know, gets whatever they can. And then the editor who creates the story from whatever was gotten. Over. Yeah, so it's sort of exactly. Like, and, and you're sort of responsible for all three phases, which... A hundred percent. And, you know, what's interesting was this is a character story. It all happens within her heart and soul. She's the antagonist and she's the protagonist. Am I too close to the mic? No, you're good. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. She's the antagonist and she's the protagonist. And so a lot of that comes from, well, what is she feeling in this moment? What's the look? 
what's the attitude, what's the tone, what are we communicating in her words, what are we choosing to leave silent, and you know, you're telling a story that's based on one woman's performance, and, and, and in that performance, she's having scenes with herself. Well, there, it was funny, we were talking about the press person outside, and she was saying, paraphr- uh, giving me a quote, which I'm going to paraphrase, and you can tell me if it's accurate or not, that you wanted it to sort of feel like, to begin with, you say, I know that girl, then you say, I am that girl, yeah. and then you want to be that girl. Yeah, if I, and, if I try hard enough, I can well, be that well, girl. And, that, and that's, that's sort of where I want to go with this, in, in terms of like, how do you, at least, I mean, I guess it is applicable to all the phases, but how do you sort of approach telling that story such that, you know, you balance that line of like, okay, this person's not like unsympathetic yeah. because they're so whiny or it's too down and not funny or like, how do you sort cause this is a, this is a kind of tough tight rope to walk because yeah. it's, it is comedic Delicate. and at the same time it is a, a nice uh, uplifting story and there's a lot of emotion and stuff like that. So there, it could easily skew into any one of these directions yes. and yet you have to sort of try and maintain that. Throughout. So it's two part, the answer. One is because the tension is really about a woman with herself, every it frame matters. There's no, you know, there wasn't a lot of like, when you get into the collaboration process, oh, I'll let that one go to win that one. It's like, no, we have to tell this very specific story because one false beat is going to throw the whole thing off. And that dovetails into the other part of this, which is once you've seen with this character, we start with the funny sidekick, the you know hot mess, sure, yeah, yeah. best friend, who we love to laugh at, right? Who we're trained to laugh mm. at. In, in movies, you go and this is the person yeah. that's going to... And we start with her as that. As soon as you start to see vulnerability in terms of her relationship to her humor, you no longer have that kind of humor as a tool anymore because Mm. that humor now equals pain to the audience. Mm. So it's about finding where you've let the audience into the next deeper level and then finding your next style of humor that's uh, adjacent or an extension of what you've been doing, but layered. So by the end, Really, Brittany is not the the funny one by the by the end of the film, which is why there are all these great characters around her who get to have moments of comedy. Because what we've done is, by, by really ten minutes in, you start to understand that there's a lot of pain in this girl, and she's still funny as you go on. But as she starts to take herself more seriously, and she refuses to make a joke of herself, she also loses a bit of humor, which is part of the tension of the film. She she loses herself a little yeah. bit, and so as you peel back the layers of this onion, you have to understand what you're looking at now. And what was working will no longer work. So you have to create what will work. How much of this whole thing is contingent on the process of casting Joanne Bell? Um, She's incredible. Yeah, I mean, she's incredible. But there's so much sort of on that linchpin of this central performance. Like, I mean, obviously, you know, every film is important that the central characters do whatever. But in particular, since this one is both sort of a comedic element and then sort of a dramatic element. Yeah. And it's like truly her story. Right. How much of it was contingent on you guys getting the right person to play that role? I mean, paramount. I mean, Jillian, I was a fan of Jillian's forever. Absolutely. When I saw 22 Jump Street, I was writing, I was writing Brittany and I wondered like, I wonder if that girl will be Brittany, you know, when push came to shove, when it was time, I'd watched everything she'd done. I didn't know if she could do this, you know? I mean, she'd never done something like this. And it was in our conversations. I was a fan, you know? I was, like, nervous to meet her because I was, su- I, was in, I was such a fan of hers. But as we were sitting down, it became so clear that there, was, there were uh, oceans of emotionality in this woman and, uh, and desires and hopes and real vulnerability that was able to be accessed that we'd never been asked to see. And so this became an opportunity. You knew, you knew she knew how to command an audience. You knew she knew how to get the laughs. And in meeting her, you know that she knows how to be present and open and vulnerable. And, and for her, this movie was a marathon. She really dedicated herself to yeah. live, living into this role. We spent a lot of time with the script before we got onto the stage you know, got to filming and she had become this character. So, um, we were like incredibly lucky to have her incredibly lucky for her hard work. And also 
uh, I, the movie wouldn't be what it is without her. Let me posit a brief theory for you and you, let me know if you think this is actually applicable in this situation. I've always thought that comedic actors are good transitioning to drama because of their understanding of timing. Huh. And how much do you think like her understanding, like I need to hit this beat, I need to do this thing, was able to help her make that transition from somebody who was a fantastic comedic actress to somebody who clearly is also a fantastic dramatic actress? I think you're right. More than that, I think the reason comedic actors, or another reason, comedic actors are, like I want to keep working with comedic actors in dramatic ways. And part of that is because comedy is pain. That's, that's a great point too. Yeah. And, and it's about how you frame the pain. Mm. You know, it's clowning. Clowning is humiliation, yeah. right? If you go back and look at Bridesmaids, Kristen Wiig is just endlessly humiliated in that film. <laughs> that's true. And we're like, God, she's so lovable. It's like she's just humiliated. And it's, it's, it's a brilliant performance. Jillian in this, is, it's really dealing with humiliation. It's, I mean, she's just endlessly humiliated in this yeah. film in, in ways that we can relate to and identify with and aren't the end of the world. Um, but humiliation is vulnerability. And so I think... I think for comedic actors, bringing the pain to the surface and and showing the pain in a different way, not saving mm. the pain with a look, not saving the pain with um, something that feels a little wacky, might break our hearts a little bit. What was it like rounding out the cast around her? I mean, obviously Fun. she's a very strong yeah. central piece, but there's there's a lot of great talent yeah. going on around her. And it's sort of interesting because a lot of characters could potentially be two-dimensional, but right. there's some depth to some of those side characters that makes it a more engaging film. How challenging was it sort of to make that a presence that was part of the movie? You know, it, it wasn't challenging. All of the actors are so good. They're all uh, real people who are not afraid. They're not, there were no fearful people on set. Nobody was insecure. Everyone was sort of showing up and, and doing what they needed to do to tell the story. Part of the concept, the concept with Brittany was always take this girl that's this icon and then shift this character that's an archetype and then shift how we're looking at her, mm -hmm. dimensionalize her, give her a hero's journey, give her respect and dignity and all this stuff that this kind of character normally doesn't get. And in casting, it became clear we were going to do that with all the characters. Mm -hmm. So that's Seth, great, who's the gay yeah. best friend, you don't see him as the gay best friend in no, a way no. that movies treat a gay best friend. No. You treat him as a three-dimensional human who has a life of his own. Um, same with Gretchen, her mm -hmm. uh, a, a roommate, who you, who's your relationship to evolves yep. over time. There's pain in her insecurity. She's actually looking for the same thing Brittany is looking for, which is... Um, validation for being anything worthwhile. Mm -hmm. She is looking for a way to feel good about herself. And so taking the, the girl who at the start of the film is vapid and a, a, a jerk. Obsessed with social media. Yeah, and understanding in just her looks in that fight in the bathroom where she's coming from and what she needs and that she's, you know, she has these two lines throughout where it's like, sort of like, is that stupid of me? There's these little cracks of, of her actual, we don't treat them as jokes. They're yeah, actual I mean, there's like a look between them when she, they're like fighting in the bathroom and you can see like she gets it, but then she's like, I can't accept this. So it's a neat, initially like just that snap. Back yeah. And, sort of like, and yeah. in that bathroom scene, to your other point, there were lines. She had lines about her childhood, Gretchen did. She had lines about her past. Mm -hmm. And you just looked at Alice Lee's face and you thought, oh, I see. Oh, yeah. I, I get I it. I need this, yeah. I know, I know everything. I don't need to talk. That's awesome. Yeah. So the film is Brittany Runs a Marathon. Yep. It's been purchased by Amazon. Yep. Uh, it's screening here at SIF, but it's being released in August. August 23rd. Awesome. In select theaters, but then a platform release. So it'll probably be, it'll go wider as, as, the, as it goes on. Awesome. Well, congratulations on the film. Thanks, it was man. a very pleasant surprise, um, and I wish you the best of luck, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks Thank so, you so much. can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. This type don't even try to bite the side. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm a fire tonight. Because I've got space game, and it feels all right.